So we'll continue with part three of human impact, starting with alien plants. Now, alien plants um, is also similar to eutrophication algal bloom, the effect that it has on water quality. So this is also a memo from a previous exam paper that I've taken as an example. So the effect of alien um, invasive species on water quality is that they form a continuous mat on the surface of the water and an example of this uh, kind of alien plant is a hyacinth and those of you that have ever gone to Hartebespoort Dam uh, you'll see that there's quite a major problem with hyacinth in, hyacinths in that area and they just cover the water completely here you can barely see the water there at the back this is also um, an area of water that is covered completely by these kinds of plants. So what happens here is they also block sunlight uh, from reaching the lower levels of the water. So ph photosynthesis at these lower levels of the water actually stops. The plants die and they decompose and the population uh, of decomposers increases. Uh, so this is for example bacteria and they use up, use up a large amount of oxygen and then aquatic animals such as fish, frogs and so forth die due to a lack of oxygen and this decreases the quality of the water. So you can see that this um, section is very similar to eutrophication's effect on water quality. Then mechanical control and chemical control as well as biological control are the three methods in which we can get rid of alien plants or exotic plantations such as in the previous video. So mechanical control is when you remove the invasive species by hand or with machines. Now this is effective in controlling small populations because it is extremely time consuming. The advantage here is it minimizes the harm to non-invasive plants and animals because you're not pouring chemicals onto plants that are non-invasive. It is very target specific so you're only targeting the alien plants here. The disadvantage is it is labor intensive and time consuming. It takes a very long time. So this guy here on the right is busy with mechanical control, pulling out um, the alien plants. Chemical control, it uses chemicals or chemical compounds to control the spread of alien species. So this is effective in large and small populations. The disadvantage here is it is possible contamination of land and water resources because you are spraying chemicals and it may result in the killing of desirable plants um, and animal species that you actually want around. And then the target species may develop resistance to these chemicals over time and then it won't work anymore. So this is chemical control and then sometimes you'll see that they chop down trees and they'll actually paint um, some chemicals onto the plants to stop them from growing anymore. Then biological control. Um, this uses a specific species to control the spread of alien species. Both indigenous and non-indigenous species may be used and it can be environmentally safe and successful. Uh, the use of non-indigenous species may increase alien invasive species. So in this case you use for example a type of insect that will target that specific plant and get rid of it. Water purification and recycling. So water is scarce and the water that is around is not always drinkable. So we need purification systems and recycling options. So many fresh water sources are contaminated by pathogens that can cause cholera, um, diarrhea. So rural areas don't have access to save a clean drinking water that we have um, to help purify themselves. So this is a, a purification plant. Um, but not everybody has access to those in the areas that they live. So we need other methods of water purification. So one of these is uh, the straws uh, that actually filter water when uh, people can then drink straight from a river, for example. Um, and then there's also the life sack that is used uh, to store, uh, I think it's corn flour in. Once the flour is gone, uh, water can be poured into that and it actually uses UV um, uh, radiation to clean and filter the water and then there's also a filter here um, when the water is poured out that uh, will clean it. So these are very useful in areas where people sometimes live very far 
from the nearest water source where they have to travel seven kilometers one way for example to get to water moving on to food security so this is when all people have physical as well as economic access to sufficient safe nutritious food to meet all of their nutritional needs for an active and healthy life now unfortunately this is not the case across the world um, a lot of people are very um, less fortunate and don't have access to the above uh, factors. So what factors influence food security? So human exponential population growth. So basically, we cannot keep up with the food demand for all of the people that live um, on Earth at the moment. Um, then the human population growth is putting strain on the world's food supply and the demand for food will be too great to meet eventually. Uh, then other things that affect, uh, affect it is droughts and floods. So this comes with climate change. So there's more frequent uh, droughts and floods that will affect food production. Droughts increase the risk of crop failure and death of livestock. And during floods, valuable topsoil is washed away and the soil then loses those nutrients. And then the land that has lost its vegetation is then also prone to soil erosion. Then the loss of wild varieties, so the impact on gene pools, alien plants, and the reduction of agricultural land. Wastage is another example there. And then uh, poor farming practices such as monoculture, overgrazing, uh, the use of fertilizers, and the use of pesticides. But let's just quickly talk about the loss of wild varieties and their impact on the gene pools. So most food crops and livestock are due to selective breeding with wild varieties until we ended up with a product that we want. For example, cabbage, uh, lettuce, they all came from a wild mustard uh, plant. And then we came to the desired plants and we changed the way it looked completely. So this process improved our crop crops and it accelerated growth and it made livestock and crops more resistant to diseases and the changing climatic conditions. Now with selective breeding, it involves the inbreeding uh, of organisms with the genes with the de desirable characteristics that we want. So both selective breeding and genetic engineering reduces the gene pool of these species. So over time, a smaller gene pool might lead to a weaker plant or animal, and they won't be able to respond to the diseases and environmental changes. And this can lead to crop failure or livestock loss. So that reduces the amount of food available. And then the storing of seed or sperm of wild varieties and seed and sperm banks could assist in retaining genes so that they are not uh, permanent, permanently lost. Excuse me. Um, then there's a seed vault. Um, they call it the Doomsday Seed Vault. It's in Svalbard. Not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly. I think it was in Iceland or Greenland. I'm not sure. I can't remember exactly where it was. Um, but in any case, so this seed vault was built um, in case of an apocalyptic event, and this is the inside. So these literally seeds from across the world that if something does go uh, wrong, we do have seeds that can be planted in order to sustain um, food security. Then also just looking again at food wastage, uh, food wastage, so one third of food produced is lost or wasted. And at different stages of food supply, food is lost. So in developing countries, um, food wastage occurs due to poor storage or cooling facilities, uh, incorrect harvesting methods, extreme weather conditions, infestation by pests and diseases in animals. Whereas in developed countries, food wastage occurs um, because the food is still edible, but it has a use before date, so people don't want to eat it. Uh, food in supermarkets are not sold by their sell-by date, so they are discarded or um, hopefully they can be donated to organizations who can redistribute it to people that don't have access to food. And then commercial farm surpluses are usually discarded because the selling price is not high enough, so they can't make any money from it, so they just throw it away. So genetically modified foods is still part of food security. And this is also from an old exam paper, a, a 
grade 12 exam paper. So it tells us what genetically modified food is. Um, so it is genes for desired traits are removed from one plant and they are introduced into another to make a better crop. Examples of desired traits are example for resistance uh, to disease, short maturity, higher yield, cheaper food, increases nutritional value, and so forth. You can just go through that. Um, then the advantages of using GMOs um, as a source of food. So it can control pests with specific genes that are inserted into the crop. Um, this is then less harmful to the environment because you don't have to use pesticides. Um, selecting the best genes to produce better resistant crops, using specific genes to increase crop yields, um, or even livestock improvement for food security, selecting genes to increase shelf life of plants so that there's minimal waste, uh, delay ripening of fruits, uh, using specific genes to improve the nutritional value, and then using specific genes to in, uh, introduce new traits in crops to suit specific needs of a population. For in, uh, example, increasing vitamin A content in food. Now, there's also some disadvantages to genetically modified food. Um, it may have a potentially negative effects on human health, um, such as a new allergies that can develop New genes may have a negative effect on organisms in the wild. So herbicide resistant can happen uh, when that gene can be transferred to weeds and then weeds become resistant to herbicides. Uh, they cost a lot to make. And then the major thing here is ethical and religious reasons. So many people see it as tampering with nature and different religions are opposed to it as the GM food may contain genes of a prohibited or avoided food um, that they cannot consume. And then poor farming pack practices we've spoken about before. We've spoken about overgrazing and the loss of topsoil, the use of fertilizers that can lead to eutrophication, um, use of pesticides, and then monoculture we haven't talked about yet. So monoculture is when a single crop is planted on the same land for multiple years. So this takes out a specific nutrient and the quality and quantity of the crop is then affected. So eventually you'll have very small um, and low quality crops. These crops are then more sus uh, susceptible to diseases and pests. And the pests can multiply faster because their desired food source is around every year, all, all the time. Now going on to loss of biodiversity. This is quite a big chapter. Or not a big chapter but a big topic in this chapter so biodiversity is the biological diversity range or variety of life in a particular area now the importance of maintaining biodiversity is discussed with all of these points so soil generation and soil quality microbial and animal species that can condition soil uh, breaking down organic matter releasing nutrients and then the recycling of crucial elements such as nitrogen, phosphorus, and carbon. This all falls under that. Then air quality. So plants that purify air quality, they regulate the atmosphere, they filter harmful particles, and they can recycle um, oxygen. Water quality. Uh, wetlands that absorb and recycle nutrients, they can treat sewage, remove excess nutrients from the water to prevent eutrophication. Um, that all falls under water quality, pest control. So other organisms um, uh, can control pests such as birds and insects without using pesticides. Then pollination and crop production. Flowering plants that rely on other species for pollination. Um, then animals play a vital role in seed dispersal here as well. For example, um, seeds that can get... Sorry, this one. Seeds that, uh, as animals walk past them, that have a, sick, a sticky substrate that then stick to the animal's fur. And when the animal walks, it uh, distributes those seeds and then they can, um, well, grow in different areas. Then preventing natural disasters. So forests and grasslands here are protect against erosion and floods. Ecosystems on riverbanks help absorb excess water. Salt marshes and mangrove forests help prevent erosion of the coastlines. Then climate stabilization, uh, plants that can help absorb carbon dioxide. 
um, moisture through evaporation of these trees leads to rain. Forest that acts as insulators and windbreak uh, breaks in cold climates. Then food security. It provides a variety of food types. Wild food provide food when agricultural supplies fail. And then genes from wild populations help strengthen the agricultural gene pool. Healthcare. So yeah, you can have plant medicines. And for ex an example of that is penicillin that comes from fungus. Then ecotourism, that forms a very big part uh, of the economy, specifically the South African economy, with um, people come, coming from all over the globe to come and see our wildlife. What are the factors that reduce biodiversity? So habitat destruction is one, and this is caused by poor farming practices, Gulf estates, Gulf estates, um, take up a lot of area and then the natural uh, vegetation is destroyed in that area so they can plant grass and then water it. Uh, mining, urbanization, de uh, deforestation and loss of wetlands and grasslands here all fall under habitat destruction. Uh, poor farming practices, we've spoken about, about that, monocultures, um, overgrazing, so all of that poor um, well, wrong irrigation systems, Gulf estates we just spoke about, mining we've just spoke about. So Gulf estates uh, are generally developed in natural environments. Exotic grasses are planted, uh, fertilizers are used, and then lots of water is used to irrigate the grass. With mining, uh, valuable topsoil and trees are removed, and habitats of animals are destroyed. Soil er erosion and degradation happens there urbanization so more houses are built leading to more natural habitats being destroyed increase in water air and soil pollution deforestation we've just spoken about that that leads to soil ero erosion flood threats and so forth um, destruction of wetlands and grasslands so there's a flood risk then and natural habitats of many birds and animals are also destroyed and then weeds can take over overgrazed grasslands in that in that area in those areas poaching also a big problem that we face in south africa that affect the biodiversity so poaching refers to the illegal hunting or trapping of animals and then the illegal removal of plants so these include rhinos for their horns one of the uh, biggest problems that we have in south africa we do have um, elephant poaching for the ivory the tusks uh, but that's not such a big problem um, as they would have in Kenya, for example. So in Kenya, they actually destroyed the ivory um, just to, to get that off the market. So wild animals for their meat, uh, tortoises, shellfish, which is abalone, um, stripped from the coastlines, cycads, which are living fossils, um, they are also, but this is more for exotic or, or collectors that collect these cycads, but they are also poached. So this is um, what ivory is used for, for ornamental value. Rhino horn is also used for, for jewelry, ornamental value, and then for, um, they are used as an aphrodisiac, or in some cases people believe that they can cure cancer, which is not true, because I'm sure most of you would have heard that rhino horn is made up of keratin, which is the same as your hair and fingernails. And this is where we'll end the third video. In the next one, we'll start off with the sustainable use um, of uh, certain medicinal plants.